What being a father means to me means responsibility. What a father means to me is stability. Oh, man. My, my father's like my big brother, man. Like he's, he's not a lot older than me, but I say that because, you know, usually big brothers are the male that like shows you how to do stuff and that you look up to and that you kind of have this playful relationship where you can gain wisdom easily from. And your father's like a disciplinarian that's like this untouchable, generally, historically, but my father was never that for me. He was always joking around. He always like was able to talk any question. From six years old, I remember him talking to me about like the birds and the bees and all these things, because I asked him. And he was like, well, if you're curious, I guess it's time for me to talk to you about these things. And he was always like that. He never held information from me. He always gave it to me in a way that was palatable, adjustable, and always allowed me to sit at the table. So I gained most of my wisdom sitting listening to my father and his friends talk. And when I would ask a question, they would answer my question. Beautiful June day, we out here in Brooklyn, New York. Can't complain at all, man. God's grace has brought us together. It's a culture brunch, we out here once again, man. Brownsville, we on Belmont. Brooklynites, you hear our Brooklynites out here, a lot of Caribbean flavor, you know, and we celebrating the Father's Day edition of the culture brunch. Fatherhood, legacy. Dear Father, Dear Father. culture brunch. So, it's gonna be amazing. We, um, you know, we came together as, uh, I mean, we're cousins, you know, my name is Hard Hit Harry. I'm Jim, Jimmy Brea. Now, I'm putting my government out there because I'm not hiding from nobody. Yeah, man. Yeah, Super, Super JB. JB. <laughs> you know, um, we came together as, uh, as cousins first and foremost, and we decided to, um, to put some music together, you know what I mean, and, and get in the studio. And uh, we've been creating, you know, we've been but, creating. But long before that, we always had a good vibe with the music. Right. It's like, we just click. Like DJs. Yeah, we just click. It's just, it's just something about his style and my style. We don't, we compliment each other. And no matter what he plays, I go into a different thing and it just compliment each other. Everybody just feeling our vibe. And we just give thanks that we like to make people feel good. And, and this Dear Father is a reflection of just something that, for the Father, it's about making people feel good. And that's what Father is to us. We decided to call it do, Doing It Big initially. And then um, Easter Sunday, my father passed. You know, my father died. That was a moment. And it was a, it was a heavy moment because we were, here we are getting ready to release this track, Doing It Big. And then my father died, you know? So... It was really intense and you know we're gonna get into it you know with um with the panel discussion but you know i talked to jay and i was like jay you know my father just died man i was like we're about to release this record doing it big didn't didn't fit you know the the moment it didn't feel it didn't fit the the, the spirit of right it, it what, what we were going through you know and at that moment when we started thinking about it it's like you know what you know we want to pay homage not, you know, to Harry's father first and foremost because that moment was about his father. And then it grew bigger than that and became about, you know what, it's gonna also reflect on all the fathers. Right. He's a father, I'm a father. My father was a professional bodybuilder and a well-established real estate broker. And uh, he was like my hero, like, you know, even though he never really was around, like I looked up to him for everything he stood for and everything he, he, he kind of did in, in terms of his professional life, you know what I mean? Um, he was just something to look up to, you know what I'm saying? But he, he, he never really was around. And I kind of, like as a kid growing up, I found myself always begging for him to be around. You know what I'm saying? And my mom used to be like, oh, your father's not shit, you ain't shit. But you know, as a kid, you don't believe that. Man, you know what I'm saying? You, you know, I see my moms every day. I don't see my father. So it's like, damn, I love my dad. I love my dad. The, the, the thing is, is that my father really wasn't a good father. Because he, he, was, he was married. You know, he had another family. So he was... You know, he's probably more attentive to his his kids. You know, I was just, you know, a product of an affair he had with my mom. I didn't have the best relationship with my father. My father was not present in my life. Um, you know, I was born in Haiti. So coming from Haiti and moving to Brooklyn at a young age, you know, my father and my mom you know, they clashed, you know, I was a product of a divorce. So I was a product of, of a divorce. My mom took me and my brother to Canada at a young age. And my mom actually 
couldn't, you know, as a single mom, she had to work. And she's, you know, we're in Canada, a whole new environment, right? So she had to go work for a director as a living nanny, right? And my brother and I couldn't live with her because, you know, she was the living nanny, right? So imagine being young, my parents split up, no, no father, my mom couldn't be with my mother except on the weekends, and I was living in a boarding home, all right? My brother and I. My brother's crying like every day. He's like, where's mom? Where's dad? So I had to be that dude, that father figure to my brother, right? And to make a long story short, you know, we went from Canada to Jersey. I grew up in Jersey, became a DJ, right? Toured with the Fugees, all that. And I became somebody, you know, I became somebody. And my father wasn't in my life. And every time that we spoke, we always clashed. But the funny part about it is, I'm a DJ and I love music because of my dad. Sadly enough, I never had the opportunity to meet my grandfather, but along my life, I learned that he um, saved photos and um, all sorts of mail that he got from my family and I, and he saved so many milestones in my life, and it was and my siblings, and it was just great to know that about him, that he loved us from afar, and I appreciate that. Um, great to know that my father is a great father that he is today, considering that him and his father didn't have a great relationship that didn't stop him from being a great father to my siblings and I. Like I'm, I'm a preacher's kid, right? So we grew up subtly understanding our commitment to serving in the community without it ever being said. Like there was no language for it. It's just, it was inherent in what my dad and my mother and people in, in that circle did. And for me, if I can do, honestly, if I could do one quarter for my children, what my father did for me, I will feel some way accomplished as a father. And that's real talk. No, unfortunately, my, my father died when I was 13. And, and the funny thing is many a day I struggle on how, how, much more, how much stronger, how much more powerful I could be if he was still here. Because some of it I had to do without him being present. But as a testament to how powerful he was, I'm able to still make a difference in my community based on what I learned up to the age of 13. Both what he taught me verbally and then the nonverbal cues that he gave me are what make me who I am today. So I'm just like, sometimes I'll be mad, man. I'll be like, Dad, why would you, why would you leave me with, with everything that's going on and with no real roadmap? But I realized that there was a roadmap, right? When I, when I think back on it really, really hard, he gave me a roadmap and, and to me, is providing that for my kids, both my natural, physical kids and the kids in the community to some degree. But to speak to the fathers, um, as, a, as a young girl that didn't have a father around, see, father set the standard, meaning like the way that your father treats you is the standard for how you are going to deal with men from that point forward. So if you have a father that treats you like a princess, you will not accept a man that treats you anything less than a queen. So when you don't have the father around, you're forced to create that standard for yourself. The father is, is extremely important because that's the standard. And I think that men don't realize that enough. That when they stay out of their young girls' lives, and I mean for the boys too, but I can only speak as a daughter. When they stay out of their young girls' lives, they're doing them a disservice. Firstly, my dad came into my life when I was nine years old. And he was dating my mom. And from day one, like we clicked. We could talk about sports, he made me laugh. He was always very interested in getting to know me because he loved my mother. And so he automatically loved me, you know. And I always say that it's not the blood that makes a father, it's the act. And he is a father in every sense of the word. Like I can't complain, literally, 
about anything. What a father means to me is stability. You know, um, the men that I grew up watching and want to emulate, they had that strong personality and they was that stable force in the relationship. And that's, that's always been very, very important to me. Um, the way respect, the way they command respect, but they give respect. Because of that, it means so much that I try to be that kind of stern, not stern, but that strong, stable force that the kids can rely on, that they know they can depend on, they know no matter what, I'm gonna be consistent. Um, love, I'm gonna love them regardless, and when they use that word unconditional, a father's love is unconditional. I had an opportunity to exemplify fatherhood for millions of people who didn't have a father. And they would tell me this. I can't tell you the amount of Maliks that are 21, 22 and under that were named after me because of a show. Or oh, when I'm in South Africa in 1996 and a 13, uh, 65 year old white woman in Cape Town. If you've ever been to South Africa, like <laughs> Cape Town's a special place and especially during apartheid. And this was two years after apartheid, and a 65-year-old white woman comes up to me in a mall and says, my 13-year-old grandson wants to be like you because of that role you play. And that was a white woman. Countless black folks, Latino folk, all kinds of folks would say things like, yo, you know, the way that you are on that show, I tell my father, why can't you be like that? Wow. Or, you know, I didn't have a father, so I look at you and, you know, model that behavior. You know, in my age, it's... It's a balance, I think, because um, I have my things going on, music, my friends, my lady, you know, which is his mom. We want to go out, we want to go to the movies, we want to hang out, uh, go to the bar, grab a drink, but now it's time for sacrifice because I can't do all those things and be an active father for Noah's um, You know, so it's a little different. It's not, I wouldn't say anything bad, you know, it's just different. It's, it's learning sacrifice. You know, I like to say to all the up and coming fathers out there, you know, fathers that are about to be fathers or young men that are about to be fathers, um, stay strong for your family. You are that rock. You are the, you know, you are the provider. So you have to do whatever you have to do, short of robbing a bank <laughs> or going to jail or selling drugs. But do what you have to do to support your family. Hustle. Constant hustle mode. Constant hustle mode. Okay? Because you have to think of that child and that child must never go hungry. That child must never not have food on, on, you know, food on the table. That child must always have clothes, nice clothes. Okay? That's the, that, that's the mentality of being a father, is to provide and be that guiding force and support that child. Just think of that child.